So, we're at Easy Park. My name's Chris. Uh, Rob. Safa. Safa. And um, we actually just met here today. We didn't know each other before this, but this has been one of the most amazing experiences these past 24, 48-ish hours. Um, and so I, I came with the idea for Easy Park. It started from my trip to San Francisco over winter break. I, um, I used Uber for the first time. I don't know how many people have used Uber. But basically, it's a taxi service where the guy shows up at your house, you get in the car, he takes you to your destination, and you get out, and that's it. You don't take out your wallet, you don't get your phone, you don't do anything. You just get out. It was just the most amazing experience. Um, now, to contradict that, I had rented a car a little later, and I had to drive around, and when I went to park, I had to um, carry around a ton of coins with me, or they had this clunky pay-by-phone system. I had to take out the app and uh, type in a number and think about how long I was going to be there. And so I was like, there's much, there should be a, there should be a way like Uber to do this where I can just go about my day and not think about it. So I came up with Easy Park. So basically the concept is this. Um, your car has a device in the glove compartment. The meter has a device in it as well. And the meter maids have a device to read off this information. So when you're in your car, you pull it to the meter, you get out, you go about your day. The device in your glove compartment makes a connection with the device in the meter and the meter starts tracking how long you're parking the meter for. When you drive away, the connection separates, so the timer stops, and then when the meter maids come to collect the coins, they take their device out, they scan, and they pull the logs of all the um, timers from the meter. Then on the back end, you get charged, and everybody wins. So, <laughs> um, so basically what we have demoing here right now is, um, so I'm acting as the car, so this is my device on the car, I just pulled it to my spot, um, and this is the readout from the meter, so what's happening here, it's pulling my ID, so each driver has their own ID that's registered on the database, on um, mine has to be 98765, and then this is the timer, it's just checking every three seconds that, oh, I'm currently still in the spot. Now say for instance I were to, you know, disconnect from the spot. Just to the number, uh, to the right of the four E's there? Yeah, so the E, 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 and then 164 would be the second timer, I was there for 164 seconds. So I disconnected, my car drove away, I'm no longer connected to the Bluetooth, the timer stops, and the meter has a log of how long I was there. And the meter mate comes, she sees, oh, ID 98765, I was there for 167 seconds, and I get billed accordingly. Um, and that's the basic concept. Um, I guess you guys are doing what's out there? Or? Oh, no, I'll talk a little bit yeah, about it. Yeah. Sure, so um, we, uh, like a lot of the other teams here, uh, with Bluetooth, ran into a lot of problems with uh, figuring out the libraries, because once you get that, then you can start programming the logic of your project, but before you can do that, it's just kind of a pain. So we only got to the very beginnings of the communication between our devices and setting up the very basic interaction of logging the user, identifying that as an easy park, and tracking times. Um, but we did think in advance of what the ultimate product would be and how it would function uh, with the least amount of user input, but the most security and the most uh, redundancy to make sure that it worked correctly. So some of the things we thought of was uh, security. And um, one of the ways that we thought would be a good idea to implement security would be that um, the, the meters would park the unique IDs um, that they would uh, detect and the times and that would contain no bank account information. That would all be linked after the meter maid had brought that back to the home facility and plugged that into the computer. Um, another thing we thought about was how to get over the fact that multiple meters might pick up the same Bluetooth signal from one car. And since all of the meters would have uh, Bluetooth transceivers in them, we thought that once a new car would be detected that wasn't there in the past uh, two or so minutes, that they could all query each other and say, who has the strongest signal strength or possibly triangulate and say who should take this car and then all the others ignore it. Um, yeah, um, so. An important part of our creative process was thinking of a lot of edge cases being, um, for example, if you're um, in your car and you're still, still have the engine on and you're sitting there, you shouldn't be having to pay for parking, so we implemented a button that could be used to turn it on and off if you have a case like that. Oh, and no, one last thing was uh, we wanted to make sure that implementation of this system into a city or something that wanted to adopt it would be as simple as possible and as cheap as possible. So instead of uh, rewiring hard wires into the meters, 
or uh, changing the device on top of them. We were thinking about having a small enclosure that would contain our easy part technology that would be securely designed and just clamp onto existing analog parking meter uh, poles. That way, that functionality would still be there on top, but if somebody did have an easy park system, they could just pull up, it would indicate that they were paying through easy park, and then the meter may would know, okay, I don't have to worry about the fact that there's no coins in here, and it'd be very simple to install. And that's right. So this was, we, did, we went over a ton of edge cases. That was one of the last ones we got to. Um, and I don't think we actually did get to. Yeah, I, I thought about that. Um, so spoofing in the sense that you're using somebody else's ID and saying that they're supposed to be in this parking spot. Right, right, yeah. Okay, so you just want to be malicious against somebody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be parking. Yeah. So right, right, right. What was that? Sorry. I don't want to give you the number. Oh, okay. So you snag somebody else's ID and. Yeah. We actually did think about this. I was saying something about how the, um, the ID would be attached to an account number right, that right, wasn't right. accessible by. See, that would provide security, but not if they try to use somebody else. Because then they oh, just get back to the register. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about this a little bit and uh, didn't really think it completely saw me through, but uh, maybe something involving um, where it's very difficult to replicate a valid other user ID. So if you just try to put out something that's not your own, but it's gibberish, then the easy park device that's on the meter will not have its little green indicator light saying, due to this parking spot is okay, and you're open for a ticket. So sure, you can try to spoof the, the meter, but you're wide open for a ticket. Um, in terms of making it also difficult for a user to set an exact Bluetooth identifier, we could have some kind of encryption, maybe like um, uh, rolling, I think it's called, like garage doors have, or maybe some kind of hard-coded chip that has to go in like um, in uh, television boxes. What, uh, what school are you guys from? Uh, I go to UMass. Uh, MIT. Well, cool. Well, these are the components that you have there real quick. Sure, so, um, alright, so oh, we also need to go over the meter rate. So, the, um, there's three components. There's the device that's in your car, there's the device that's in the meter, and there's the device that the meter mate carries. So this would be an example of the car device minus the breadboard. It's simply a BLE mini chip um, from Red Bear Labs. They have libraries that we have to work through. Um, and it's basically, it can work as a sender and a receiver. We have this one working strictly as a sender. It's basically constantly saying, I'm a car, I'm a car, here's my ID, here's my ID, wherever it goes, unless you turn the switch off. Um, secondly, there's the meter, who is always looking for IDs, um, and it's also communicating with the meters around it to say, oh, I'm the closest to this car, let me handle it. Um, and then it takes the ID, and as long as the ID is in contact with it, it logs the time. The third component is the meter mate, carries the device around with her, when she's collecting her coins, she scans our, our device on the meter, and um, Based, or she presses a button basically and says, oh, hi, I'm the meter mate, I'm here to collect. And it would, um, the meter then sends out the log file to the meter mate and then it wipes the, um, the meter itself so that the cache is available. And uh, when we try to come up with our configurations, we try to make it so that the two devices that wouldn't be hardwired into power would be uh, using as little power as possible. <coughs> so, for example, the thing that goes in the glove compartment is only sending and we could really easily adjust the interval at which it would send or maybe have a physical on and off switch on there. And the same thing with the meter maid who's reading it could you know, turn that on or only query with a button press maybe on the device. Um, any questions? Do you think whether with the the communication is? Well, yeah, so Bluetooth, that's one of the downfalls of Bluetooth. It's very, um, it has to, the conditions have to be pretty good for it to work as well as you want to. I mean, we're hoping with the more data points we have to work from, so if we have a lot of meters around or possibly even a lot of cars around, just being able to pull RSI values from each individual piece to get a more accurate um, sense, sort of like what iBeacons are trying to do now. I don't know if you guys have heard about those, where just the more beacons you have in the room, um, you get more data points to work off of to get a more accurate um, representation of where you are. So, awesome. in a way, I would think that um, the 
the realities of the car and where the device is placed specifically in the car would affect more than the weather. Because weather is, in my head at least, I don't have much experience with Bluetooth, but I would think that that would be something that would affect all directions outside your car uniformly. Whereas, say, if you had the Easy Park directly next to a metal piece, and but then glass to the front, that could make some kind of directional bias. So, yeah, I've, I would say maybe weather could affect it in terms of decreasing the signal strength of all meters altogether, but that would still result in one highest one. The big thing to think about would be placement. This situation now is any other space, you know? Uh, oh. In which case, maybe everyone would get free parking because you can't make sense to make it. If you have a race, We didn't think into that too much, but the, the backup case is always that it will tell you whether or not you've paired by having a little green indicator light. So if it's just crazy day and nothing's working, just break out some photos, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys.